It's a great honor and pleasure to be back here in Canada, the only country on earth that has the same religion as my native Sweden, ice hockey. <laughs> it was quite the stunner to open this tote bag and see, whoa, my book, there. So uh, we've had a lot of fascinating discussion at this conference about the impact on AI mainly focused on the relatively near term, I want to take a big step back here, as the book title suggests, talking about the ultimate impact on, on life itself from artificial intelligence. Let's begin here. 20 seconds and counting. And let's see if we can get some audio as well. 12, 11, 10, 9, ignition sequence start, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0, all engine running, liftoff, we have a liftoff, 32 minutes past the hour, liftoff on Apollo 11. So raise your hand if you actually saw the launch of Apollo 11 when it happened. Yeah, that was pretty amazing. This mission was not only a success, but also inspiring. Showing that when we humans manage technology wisely, we can do things that our ancestors could only dream of. So in this spirit, I want to spend the rest of my time here talking about another journey, powered by a technology even more powerful than rocket engines and where the passengers aren't just three astronauts, but all of humanity. So let's talk about our collective journey into the future with artificial intelligence. My friend and FLI co-founder, Jan Tallinn, who helped give you Skype, likes to emphasize that it's crucial not just to make technology powerful, but also to figure out how to control it and to figure out where we want to go with it. And those are going to be the themes of my talk. I said that we're going to take a step back. Here's a big one. During the past 13.8 billion years, our universe has transformed not just from hot to cold, from dense to more rarefied, but most importantly, from really boring to really interesting. Even coming alive and having self-aware beings, feeling pleasure and pain and pondering the mysteries of AI here in Toronto today. This picture is humbling in the sense that even though Toronto in this conference is very action-packed, on the grand scheme of things, life is still an almost imperceptibly small perturbation on a seemingly lifeless universe. Right? But this picture is also inspiring, because we realize now that technology, and the laws of physics tell us that it doesn't have to remain that way at all. In fact, as I explained in, in um, chapter 6 of my book, I feel that science fiction writers even have still dreadfully underestimated how easy it actually is for life to spread throughout the cosmos because they weren't taking artificial intelligence into account when they wrote all these. And so there's a huge upside, not just on Earth, but also on the cosmic scale for life to flourish in the future if we get it right with AI. I call the earliest life 1.0 because it was really dumb. Couldn't learn anything in its lifetime. I call us 2.0 because we can learn, which in uh, nerdy geek speak would be expressed as that we can design our own software. If I want to have s legal skills, I can decide to go to law school and upload all these knowledge modules and now I can do other things. Life 3.0, which can design not just its software but also its hardware, of course doesn't exist yet, but we seem to gradually be heading a little bit in that direction. We can get artificial knees, cochlear implants, pacemakers, and stuff like that. So coming back to our rocket metaphor, let's start by talking about the growing power of AI. You've had many wonderful examples of this here, so let me just blitz through it at a very high level. I define intelligence simply as the ability to accomplish complex goals. The ability to accomplish complex goals. I give this very broad definition because I really hate carbon chauvinism. This attitude that you can only be intelligent or conscious or whatever if you're made of carbon atoms. I want to give this broad definition so that it includes all forms of both biological and artificial intelligence. When uh, Gary Kasparov got his posterior kicked by IBM's Deep Blue some two decades ago, 
Right? The intelligence in this machine was programmed in by humans who knew how to play chess. And the computer won mainly because it could think faster and remember more than he could. In contrast, when Google DeepMind dethroned humanity in Go, it was very different. Two, year, two weeks ago, we saw how AlphaGo Zero was able to blow away 3,000 years of human-acquired Go wisdom in three days without any human input whatsoever. Because the machine just figured it all out, learned it for itself. A nice illustration of, of deep reinforcement learning in action is this deep mind agent learning to play the game of breakout. And what I find so fascinating here is, you have to remember, this is a very, very simple system, a neural network, which has no idea what a paddle is or a ball is or anything, what a game is. It just gets sent, sent as input a bunch of numbers which tell you what the colors are of each pixel on the screen and sends random commands without knowing what they do to try to maximize its score. And eventually, it starts getting better. It's already better than I am. As you can see doesn't miss the ball hardly ever. And when you keep training it, eventually it actually starts to exhibit what I feel seems kind of intelligent. It discovers a strategy in particular that the folks who did this at Google DeepMind weren't aware of. That if you keep aiming the ball at the, at a, at the corner, you can drill a hole there, and once you've done that, you just brutally rake in the points. And look how it just ruthlessly keeps exploiting this. Over and over and over again. Again, completely tabula rasa, right? knowing nothing to going into it. And now you might say, well, this game world of Go or, or Breakout here is way simpler than the real world. So how far can you push these sort of techniques? Well, here's another thing that DeepMind did last summer, trying to teach robots to walk. And this is what happened. Here again, the software had no idea what walking was. It had never been shown any videos of walking or the concept of walking. It just sent random commands to determine the angles of all the joints here and was rewarded every time this thing moved a little bit forward. That gradually kind of got the hang of it. Rediscovering all sorts of ways of, of locomotion, not just for humanoid figures, but for all sorts of other shapes. So this, this sort of progress really begs the question, right? How far can this go? If you're a robot or an AI, the whole, all of the real world can be thought of as a game as well, right? You can think of the stock market as a game, and in many ways machines already outplay us there. How far can we go? I like to think about it in terms of this landscape of skills. This is a picture I drew inspired by Hans Moravec's book. And uh, the elevation here represents how hard each task is for a machine to do. The sea level represents how good machines are at doing it right now. So the progress in AI we've heard about at this conference means that there's kind of a global warming going on here in this task space where the sea levels are rising, right? So obviously we don't want to recommend to our kids that they look for jobs right on the shoreline because they're going to be the first to be flooded. And the question is, what's going to happen eventually? Some people, including many AI researchers I very much respect, think we're never going to succeed with AI replicating all human skills and some mountain peaks here will forever be above the water. But a lot of other AI researchers I also respect greatly think that AI will succeed and eventually everything is going to get flooded. In fact, this is a more common view in the polls that have happened where most people, well, well the median answer for, for when machines will be able to do everything we can tends to be maybe a few decades from now. So more likely than not, it's going to get flooded. Now, where does this leave us? Well, if there is even a serious possibility of this, we have to talk, of course, about how we want to steer this technology to make sure we're excited about where, where this takes us. So let's talk about control of AI, steering things in the right direction. It was to help with this that we founded the Future of Life Institute that was mentioned in, the, in my introduction. And uh, you see we have the word steer here, even in our mission statement. We are optimistic that we humans can create an inspiring future with technology as long as we win this race between the growing power of technology and the growing wisdom with which we manage our technology. But we do feel very strongly that this is a big if. 
So to win this wisdom race, we actually really have to change strategies. In the past, we've always used the strategy of learning from mistakes. We invented fire, screwed up a bunch of times, invented the fire extinguisher. We invented the automobile, oopsie, a bunch of times, invented the seatbelt, the airbag, the traffic light, and so on, and now traffic in Toronto is pretty safe. But needless to say, as science progresses and technology progresses, it's going to get ever more powerful, and at some point, it's going to cross that obvious threshold where one mistake is one too many. Right? We don't want to have a little oopsie and say, oh, we accidentally had a global nuclear war with Russia because we screwed up, but that's okay, we'll learn from mistakes and be a little more careful next time. No, it's much better if you have a really powerful technology, in particular superhuman AI, to plan ahead and get things right the first time and work really hard for this. Some people tell me, Max, don't talk like this. This is Luddite scaremongering. I say, this isn't Luddite scaremongering, this is safety engineering. Why was it that the Apollo 11 mission to the moon worked that I showed you in the beginning? It's because NASA very systematically thought through everything that could go wrong when you put three dudes on top of a 100 meter tall vehicle full of highly flammable rocket fuel and launched them into somewhere where no one could help them. There was a lot of stuff that could go wrong. Does that mean that NASA was doing scaremongering? No. That was the safety engineering that led to the success of the mission. And that's exactly how I would like us to approach the future of AI as well. And really think things through and get things right. Because if we do, the upside is enormous and very inspiring. One of the things we've done with the Future of Life Institute is organize conferences to help bring the AI community together and, and think really hard, not just about how to make the technology more powerful, how to build more powerful rocket engines, metaphorically, but also how to develop this wisdom to steer the technology well. And the output of our last conference we had this year in Asilomar was these 23 Asilomar principles, which have been signed now by over a thousand AI researchers around the world, many of whom are in this room here. And you'll recognize here many of the leaders of the, of the top companies, for example, in AI. And I want to spend just a few minutes highlighting four takeaways of this that I feel are really worth remembering. Number one, ban lethal autonomous weapons. All sciences can be used either for new ways of helping people or new ways of harming people. If you ask somebody today what they associate biology with, they will be much more likely to say new medicines and cures rather than bioweapons, right? Why is that? It's because the biologists actually as a community came out real strong and said, we want an international treaty against bioweapons, and they succeeded. And, are, and they're very happy for that now, because almost all the funding into biology is actually, there's much more funding going into new medicines than bioweapons today. Similarly, the chemists pushed really hard as a scientific community to get an international ban on chemical weapons. And even though there's been a lot of cheating on it, it's succeeded spectacularly in stigmatizing chemical weapons, to the point that Assad in Syria even gave them up voluntarily to not get invaded, right? And the AI community today is quite strongly saying we, that they simply want AI in the future to be known mainly as new solutions, not new ways of just anonymously killing people really cheaply and creating a really a race to the bottom for AI. So that's one. Another one is to try to ensure that vast surge in wealth, the growth of the total economic pie, can be used to make everybody better off so that we end up in the future that looks more like this on the right than that on the left. And it's really particularly nice to talk about this in Canada, where there seems to be a lot more sympathy for this kind of thinking than, than south of the border. That the role of society is as actually partly to actually look after people and make sure everybody gets better off. And I was particularly heartened that even Justin Trudeau himself came here today. Third, to win this wisdom race, we really need to invest in AI safety research. There's a lot of tough technical questions we need to solve. Raise your hand if your laptop ever crashed. How did that feel? <laughs> now, maybe annoying, yeah, but that's probably not the word you would use if it was the self-driving car you were driving down the freeway on, or if it was the software controlling your power grid or your 
or the U.S. nuclear arsenal or something like this, right? Third, and unless we can really get our act together with both robustness in general and also cybersecurity, all this awesome technology we're building can be hacked and used against us or just malfunction and, and screw us over. So this is something short term, which I think we've been way too flippant about. And uh, there are also a number of really interesting AI safety research questions that are crucial in the longer term. Let me show you a very short video on this topic, super intelligence related AI safety research. Will artificial intelligence ever replace humans? Is a hotly debated question these days. Some people claim computers will eventually gain super intelligence, be able to outperform humans on any task, and destroy humanity. Other people say, don't worry, AI will just be another tool we can use and control, like our current computers. So we've got physicist and AI researcher Max Tegmark back again to share with us the collective takeaways from the recent Asilomar conference on the future of AI that he helped organize. And he's going to help separate AI myths from AI facts. Hello. First off, Max, Machines, including computers, have long been better than us at many tasks, like arithmetic or weaving. But those are often repetitive and mechanical operations. So why shouldn't I believe that there are some things that are simply impossible for machines to do as well as people? Say, making minute physics videos or consoling a friend. Well, we've traditionally thought of intelligence as something mysterious that can only exist in biological organisms, especially humans. But from the perspective of modern physical science, intelligence is simply a particular kind of information processing and reacting, performed by a particular range of elementary particles moving around, and there's no law in physics that says it's impossible to do that kind of information processing better than humans already do. It's not a stretch to say that earthworms process information better than rocks, and humans better than earthworms, and in many areas, machines are already better than humans. This suggests that we've likely only seen the tip of the intelligence iceberg, and that we're on track to unlock the full intelligence that's latent in nature and use it to help humanity flourish, or flounder. So, how do we keep ourselves on the right side of the flourish or flounder balance? What, if anything, should we really be concerned about with super intelligent AI? Here's what has many top AI researchers concerned. Not machines or computers turning evil, but something more subtle. Super intelligence that simply doesn't share our goals. If a heat-seeking missile is homing in on you, you probably wouldn't think, no need to worry, it's not evil, it's just following its programming. No, what matters to you is what the heat-seeking missile does, and how well it does it. Not what it's feeling, or whether it has feelings at all. The real worry isn't malevolence, but competence. Super intelligent AI is by definition very good at attaining its goals, so the most important thing for us to do is to ensure that its goals are aligned with ours. As an analogy, humans are more intelligent and competent than ants, and if we want to build a hydroelectric dam where there happens to be an ant hill, there may be no malevolence involved, but well, too bad for the ants. Cats and dogs, on the other hand, have done a great job of aligning their goals with the goals of humans. I mean, even though I'm a physicist, I can't help think kittens are the cutest particle arrangements in our universe. If we build super intelligence, we'd be better off in the position of cats and dogs than ants. Or better yet, we'll figure out how to ensure that AI adopts our goals rather than the other way around. And when exactly is super intelligence going to arrive? When do we need to start panicking? First of all, Henry, super intelligence doesn't have to be something negative. In fact, if we get it right, AI might become the best thing ever to happen to humanity. Everything I love about civilization is the product of intelligence. So if AI amplifies our collective intelligence enough to solve today's and tomorrow's greatest problems, humanity might flourish like never before. Second, most AI researchers think super intelligence is at least decades away. But the research needed to ensure that it remains beneficial to humanity rather than harmful might also take decades. So we need to start right away. For example, we'll need to figure out how to ensure machines learn the collective goals of humanity, adopt these goals for themselves, and retain the goals as they get ever smarter. And what about when our goals disagree? Should we vote on what the machine's goals should be? Should we do whatever the president wants? Whatever the creator of a super intelligence wants? Let the AI decide? In a very real way, the question of how to live with superintelligence is a question of what sort of future we want to create for humanity, which obviously shouldn't just be left to AI researchers, as caring and, and socially skilled as we are. So that leads to the very final point I want to make. We really need to think about what sort of future we want. Why did the rocket launch that we opened this with happen in the first place? It was because of a positive vision of the future. JFK said, we do this and the other things not because it is easy, but because it is hard, like Harvard Yard, you know. And this galvanized people and transformed America from a little bit of a tech backwater to really a leader in 
and technology because people had an exciting shared positive vision, right? Uh, I often get students walking into my office at MIT for career advice. I always ask them, where do you want to be in the future? And if she says to me, oh, maybe I'll be in a cancer ward, maybe I will have been run over by a bus, that's a terrible approach to career planning. I want her to come in with fire in her eyes and say, this is where I want to be. Then we can do this kind of safety engineering sort of discussion and figure out what are the obstacles that have to be overcome to get there. But you need to have that positive vision. But we, as humans, behave just like this fictitious, silly student. I went and saw the new Blade Runner movie with my wife the other day. It's just yet another dystopic, dystop dystopian vision of the future. Almost everything we see in media where people try to envision the future is dystopian. We need to envision positive futures, where we want to go with this. And I'm not just talking about saying, oh, cure disease X grow GDP by 4%. I mean, really more detailed visions. That's why in, my, in the fifth chapter of my book, I put a lot of energy into exploring a wide range of possible societies you could have. Have these sort of conversations about where you want to go. Because if we can develop really positive visions of where we can actually end up with AI, we're much more likely to get there. And that'll be awesome. Thank you.